If you're new here, I'm Danny, and I'm a wildlife photographer, and today I'm going to answer questions about the house in Sweden, wildlife photography, and any other questions that come up. Thank you Squarespace for sponsoring this video. I'm going to begin with saying that the taxidermy is ethically sourced. It hasn't been hunted for the purpose of being on a wall. It's either been roadkill or died naturally. The red deer, which is this one, was actually found in Scotland and the lady found it and she actually processed it herself and she spray painted it with this pink glitter and she was selling it really cheap um, and no one wanted it because it was pink. So I took it and I painted it white. I sanded down all the pink and then used wood stain to make it brown but it looks pretty natural now and I also have a fox this is my red fox again this is a natural death and talking of foxes I'm actually going to photograph foxes today so I'm going to split the Q&A a little bit and answer questions whilst photographing foxes but anyway this is a red fox skull I love items of natural history and specimens. I want my room to look like a museum. Anyway, I'm going to begin with answering questions about the house because that was definitely most requested. So first question, how did you buy a house in Sweden? So I actually lived in the village that I bought a house for seven months in 2020 so I'd experienced all seasons except uh, autumn. I knew how cold it was, I knew how dark it was. The wildlife photographer, Connie, who I volunteered for, his brother helped me find the house. So he got in contact with the previous owner because he knew he'd already tried to sell it. And the guy was just like, yeah, I, I'm happy to sell it um, because he's got a couple of houses already in the village and he wanted to sell it and then the brother got me in contact with the owner and his daughter spoke English and she sent photos of the house via email and Facebook and that's how we communicated so it was all online I'd never seen the house we agreed to a price we had a handwritten contract which made me quite nervous but everything was fine then they went to the land registry, the ownership of the house was changed, and then it was mine. One of the most popular questions, how much did the house cost? The house was under 30,000 euros. Do you plan to do any renovations? So the house is in pretty good condition. The heating works very well, the floor looks very nice, all the windows are quite good. However, the house is covered in wallpaper which is a bit outdated for me um, and is bubbling in a few rooms. So in November we actually stripped all the wallpaper in the sitting room and we were going to buy plain white wallpaper or off-white and we never did it so it's just like that. Um, we also got a lot of furniture from the previous owner which I wanted to sand down and stain a darker colour and we bought all the stuff to do that and never did it. I think we're going to do all of that in the spring and the summer and there's also a very large garage or an outhouse which eventually I want to convert into a separate house for guests. And that leads me on to the other question, which is, will you take on guests in the future? And the answer is yes. I do want to host photography workshops and have guests at the house. But if we do convert the garage, I'd like that to be almost like an Airbnb and a separate thing. But we'll see. I can't afford to do that anytime soon. Uh, but that's the future for that garage. Also, I've had so many emails and questions about whether I'm leaving Sweden and selling the house. I'm not selling the house. I just can't return at the moment because of the 90 day in 180 day rule because UK left the European Union, so I can't go there for long term anymore. I didn't know that when I bought the house and also those rules hadn't been confirmed yet. Okay, last question about the house slash Sweden. 
are you still thinking about buying a section of woodland in Sweden? So I am still interested in buying the squirrel forest. The owner actually wants to cut down all the trees in the next couple of years and I don't want that to happen so I want to buy it off him. Um, we haven't come to any agreement yet um, and we haven't discussed it since last summer and I didn't see him this time round. I'll probably talk to him about that in the summer but I do want to protect that forest and make it like, I don't know, a mini nature reserve because the forest is in such a healthy condition. I hardly saw the squirrels this winter which says something. The trees are in a very good state. They are making plenty of spruce cones and pine cones. There's so much food available to squirrels and other species. So the forest is in very good condition and it's just a very good forest for so many species. Any suggestions for people who are commencing their career as a photographer? So I'm going to answer this from a wildlife point of view because I have no idea how you'd become a sports photographer or a wedding photographer, but I'm a big believer in volunteering. So one way to get closer to wildlife for a long period of time is to volunteer for a research station or a biological station or for a nature reserve. Um, so for example, this year, I'm actually going to be volunteering for a week on Skoma Island and I'm going to be making a film about that. He's been collecting nesting material for about half an hour. I'm going to show you how, as a volunteer, I can give back to nature as well as access wildlife closer and for a longer period of time. Because often when you go on a photography trip, you're paying a lot each day. But if you're going to live somewhere long term, you're more likely to get images that are unique because you just have more opportunities outside with wildlife. So I definitely recommend volunteering just to get a good portfolio of images. And also you learn a lot about the charity or the nature reserve or the conservation work. And you might be able to get another opportunity. So for example, after volunteering as a junior field biologist in Peru, they actually offered me a six month job, almost the same role, but I would be taking volunteers into the rainforest. And obviously when you're in the rainforest every day, you're going to see cool wildlife. Obviously that helps with taking the photos, but then there's the whole other side, which is selling the photos or somehow making money to become a professional. So I've gone a very different route to maybe quite traditional wildlife photographers in that I don't sell photos to magazines. I do a few articles here and there, but I mostly showcase my wildlife photography online through YouTube videos, and by having an engaged audience, I use my platforms to sell my photography products, which takes me onto my sponsor, which is Squarespace. On Squarespace, it's really easy to make a professional website with a shop. So I use Squarespace to sell my calendars and my pins, and Squarespace has completely changed how I sell my photography products because the year before, I did it all manually, and I wasted so much time sending out invoices. Squarespace has enabled me to automate almost everything. Obviously, I still pack all the calendars and sign them, but it's just become so much easier with Squarespace. Go to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, use Danny Connor Wild to get 10% off your first purchase. What's your educational background? So I actually studied zoology at university, and I focused my degree on tropical ecology. So I went to the Amazon rainforest, I went to the Costa Rican rainforest twice, and I followed spider monkeys for three months on my own. Um, had some pretty fun encounters with puma, ferdelance, which is a very beautiful yet yeah, very dangerous snake. When I went to the Peruvian Amazon, I actually got a botfly in my neck, which is basically a flesh-eating maggot, and it was situated just under my jaw, and I called him Jaws, and I actually brought him back to the UK in my neck because he was too small to take out, because you have to grow them to a certain length, because if you pull them out, you can just leave their um, eating, their, or their mouth, 
inside you because they breathe out their bottom and that's what's on your on the surface of your skin. Um, I have it in my drawer. Do I show you my my bot fly? Yeah, I'll show you. Oh, <laughs> he's quite small now. He's shrunk. Uh, but this is Jaws. I'm gonna zoom in. Um, but oh, it's kind of gross. But he's dehydrated now. But he was a lot longer and fatter. You might find this gross. I'm gonna show you. So if you're s s squeamish, look away. So there's Jaws. That's my bot fly. That was in my neck. It was actually quite a cool experience to have something living inside you, eating you. <laughs> uh, I thought it was cool. But on the way home, I still had him in my neck and my friend tried to take him out, but he was too small and I had to bring him home with me. But the way you kill it is you put Vaseline on the area where the botfly is and when it's dying because it has to breathe air it comes out of the skin <laughs> and so you can take it out with tweezers easier however because it was in my neck it was quite difficult so that's why I had to grow it or I had to grow Jaws the botfly had to grow more because if it was on my hand for example you can squeeze it out easier because there's more flesh but there's not much flesh in your neck so that's why it was difficult to get him out anyway he's here now um very much dead and not in me okay that's enough questions for now it's pretty dark out but i'm going to head into london now to find some foxes so hopefully the clouds disappear and we get some nice light but let's go Like, this is where I sit, this is my place. Oh, so cute. Did you get it? I'm going to answer a couple more questions as a voiceover. What is your motive? I love to share how much I enjoy being in nature and I hope that others are inspired to go outside and connect with the natural world after watching my videos. In the future, I'd like to make more films that share a story about people and wildlife. Did your decision to take on photography full time make it any less enjoyable for you? I definitely still enjoy wildlife photography. To me, it's all about getting outside, going on that adventure, trying to find wildlife, and the reward is always the photo. However, since going full time, I definitely feel more pressure to get photos especially if I'm taking you on a journey 
to get a photo. It seems a bit anticlimactic if I don't get the shot, but I definitely still enjoy wildlife photography like I did before I was full time. It's getting pretty dark and cold now and I'm about to go, but I thought I'd quickly explain why I'm able to get so close to the foxes here. Next to me is a fenced off area. There are no dogs allowed in this area. People can't go over there. And the reason there's a fenced off area is because they usually have deer here. But they've actually been moved to another city park, um, but because of the fence and because people can't go there, the foxes are very comfortable just moving around this area and they are quite habituated to people because this is a very busy park. So you can probably hear the sounds of London in the background and parakeets, but that's why I'm able to photograph these foxes so close. I'm going to end the video here. I've answered a lot of questions. It's quite dark now, um, but Jensen's gonna get some dinner. You hungry? Yeah, yeah, you're very hungry. Um, but I'll see you in the next video. I'm not sure what the next video will be because I'm going on like three or four trips and I don't know what I will edit first. Stop looking at your brother. Sean, do you want to be on video? Okay, Sean's here now to say goodbye. You meant to say bye. Your arm is floppy. Put it up. That's it. Bye.